President Marvin, past District Governor Tony, Zone Chairman Gene, fellow lines, ladies, guests, and honorable tail twisters. Line Tony, this is like old times. Yes, sir. <laughs> A lot of people's information that uh, Line Tony and I, with uh, our wives, uh, James Stewart, we made about a almost 100 visits. He made more than I did, but 100 visits, and I would get up each night and introduce Tony. So this kind of brings back old memories. <laughs> so this is kind of a thrill. Tonight I'm, uh, I'd say, very, very honored to have as our guest to the club and the program tonight uh, a lifelong resident and a very good friend of mine and a teacher of mine, uh, Mr. Beverly Gerald. His wife tonight is our program, and I appreciate his response on our asking to come to the club and, and giving us a few things that I think that uh, a lot of people were aware of and a lot that were not. And his background, he's lived in Omaha all his life. He was a teacher, if I have this incorrect, for about 29 years, teacher and coach in the Omaha Independent School District. He taught myself history, speech, and tried to teach me to write. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget the curly cues and the things. I saw him the other day at the bank, and uh, I was bringing back those memories, and that thought hit me. And certain things like that stick in your mind even about 20-something years later. Uh, uh, tonight, he'll give us a very interesting program on in the history of Humble. I'm sure you'll find it to be uh, a very informative program and a lot of things that you probably didn't know about our community. This time, let's welcome uh, Bevel Gerald to give us a good program. Thank you, Alan, for those kind and flattering remarks. The thought comes to me, though, what did he think those 20 odd years ago when he sat in my classroom and I gave him that homework. What <laughs> adjectives did he use then? <laughs> but I'm quite honored tonight. This is a privilege, a pleasure to be chosen as your speaker. The work of the Lions Club is well documented. The community appreciates the projects that, that you work so hard and diligently with and for each year. All of us are proud of you. I'm proud to be here tonight as your guest. Thank you for a good supper, your wonderful friendship, and I do love to hear you lions roar. <laughs> It brings back a little story to me when I was in teaching and coaching. I never had an afternoon off. As soon as the bell rang, I usually went to the basketball court or the football field or the track field or somewhere or other and had a group of boys waiting there for me. And it took me till dark to tell them what I wanted them to do come Saturday. Okay. On this particular day, though, I had no afternoon duties, and I told the, 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 the kids, I said, don't get in the door. When the bell rings, I don't want to run over anybody. <laughs> the perch was biting on the lake, and I was going to go as straight as I could and get in my boat and go out on the lake. And as I went home, I happened to pass along the way, the road, I passed a little colored boy, a little black boy walking along, and I said, hey, boy, what you, where are you going? He said, I'll just go down the road there. And I said, say, if you'll come go with me and row my boat for me while I fish this afternoon, I'll give you a quarter. <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll go. So we got in my pickup truck, and we went on down to the house, got in the boat, went out on the lake. I got my pole, put a men on, out I go. I handed him the paddle, and he looked at it like a mule looking at a new gate. <laughs> and he just sat there, and I said, say, boy, I thought you told me you could row. He said, yes, sir. But I thought you meant row like a lion. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't come tonight to listen to my old worn out jokes. 
I'm supposed to relate to you and retell the stories and the nostalgia of our great heritage. Now, before I start, I'd like to raise a few questions that you're to keep in mind as we go along. Number one, why Stacktie? Why Granberry? Why? Why Herman? Now, I bet you this people that's sitting here don't even know what I'm talking about. Why? Who was the first settler that ever came into this area? What was his name? When did he get here? Where did he live? Who was number two? Who was number three? Where did they live? What was their name? When did the first school, was the first school built here in Humble? Where was it located? How about the first church? How about the first road, improved road? I'm not talking about the just old dirt roads that just wound around at the path of least resistance. I'm talking about an improved road. Where was it? When was it built? When did Bender start the sawmill era? Where was his mill located? Where did he come from? I'm going to try to tell you a few of these things. But before I get into the real story, what I need to do is I need to roll back the clock. 158 years. What was this area like 158 years ago? Time out. Now, in the course of my talk, I'm going to tell you the answer to the questions that I just brought up. But I wanted to, to, to project backwards this 158 years and tell you what was going on at that time. Now, Mexico had only been a republic for three years. The year that we will start with is 1828. Mexico was only four years old, and uh, the Republic had been established in 1824. The Louisiana Purchase was only 25 years old. There was only 32 towns in the United States with a population over 8,000. When the first man came here, now, I'll ask you this. How, how, you have no idea of how much railroad track or how many roads, or I'll tell you. There was only 30 miles of track in the whole United States in 1828 when the first man came into this area. There was only 25, there was only 32 towns of over 8,000, so there couldn't be too many roads nor railroads. Now, the Claremont was only 19 years old. The steam engine had only been invented for 15 years, so trains couldn't have been long for this world. What towns was in this area? I'll tell you this, there wasn't any Dayton, Mr. Guthrie. Wasn't no Dayton. Wasn't no Crosby, no New Caney, no Huffman, no Tomball, no Splendora, no Cleveland. And Houston would need to wait eight years for the Allen brothers to land on Buffalo Bow. The first man to come into this area in 1828, his name was Joseph Dunman. He got here in 1828. There had only been six presidents. John Quincy Adams was president of the United States, and Missouri had just came into the Union as a 24th state. Joseph Dunman, where was he from? Liberty, Texas. Born and raised on Target and Prairie, but had moved with he and his family and one child to Liberty, Texas. And he came from Liberty to, um, to, to, to this area. What was he looking for? He had to pass through some pretty good country. He had to pass through Dayton and Crosby to get here. What was he looking for? What kind of a man was he? He was an adventurer. He thought that he would find that land of milk and honey, a hunter's paradise, and he found it. 
he first settled on a wilderness trail, not by your wildest imagination do you imagine this to be a rule. The Mexicans had built a mission at Liberty called Mission Atascacita. Spell no telling how, I can't even pronounce it, much less spell it. But the old timer said Atascacita. They did not say Atas. Now I would not tell you the correct pronunciation. I can only tell you how my pappy and his pappy before him said it. They said a Tuscacita. He came, this man, Joseph Dunman, came along the old Tuscacita Trail. The Mexicans had built one mission in Liberty, a Tuscacita, and another one in Nacogdoches called Atascosa. And to supply the mission in Nacogdoches, they hacked out a wilderness trail, went around the bogs, dodged the Yopon thickets, so their trail could not have been very straight. But it was a passable trail for an ox cart. Along this Atuscacita trail came Joseph Dunman, and he settled, does anybody in here know where Jig Gothard lives? Sure you know where Jig Gothard lives. He lives out there by Amy. Amy Farm, truck farm, okay. Just beyond Jiggs Gothard, just 400 yards, the Texas company did have for a long, long time a little tank battery. Between Jiggs Gothard and that tank battery, Joseph Dunman put down his roots. They call it deep sand today. It took him two years to find out he couldn't raise a racket on that deep sand. So he moved a little closer into the river bottom, into the Camp Lily area, and there he struck it rich as far as growing things is concerned. Because after all, there was no pizza parker, parlor, or burger hut right around the corner. He had to grub it out one way or the other. He had to catch or kill everything that was on the table. So right there is where it happened. He found good water. He wanted to live in a place that did not have too many trees because the chainsaw had not been invented in 1828. So he wanted the land to be semi-cleared, yet he wanted to be close enough to timber for his log cabin and his outbuildings. So there he settled. And it was eight years before anything happened of any consequence. And along about this time, a man by the name of Sam Houston was having a little trouble with another fellow named Santa Ana. And Sam Houston sent riders through this area, and he sent them to tell anybody that lived here that they better get their families and get out because he didn't know where this rhubarb was going to take place. So I have here a little notation to tell you that in 1836, we had the seventh president, Andy Jackson, how many states it was in the Union, and who had just came in. Okay, he went back to Liberty, where he came from, and there he began to tell his friends what a wonderful land of milk and honey that he had found. Among the people that was his friends was my <coughs> pappy. His name was Elisha Madison Isaacs, but everybody knew him as Booge, Uncle Booge. Uncle Booge was a friend of Joseph Dunman, and he told him. Another fellow by the name of Plez was a friend of Joseph Dunman. They called him Uncle Plez, but his name was Samuel Pleasant Humble. Spelled H-U-M-B-L-E, pronounced U-M-B-L-E Humble. <laughs> boy that just got here from Detroit, he's still talking about the humble this and the humble all over his salivates. It does. It just salivates me. Anyhow, his name was Samuel Pleasant Uncle Plez Humble. He went on the San Jacinto River, he found high ground, and he built him a log hut. That log hut was to serve him and this area as a post office for many years. 
while Uncle Pleas operated a ferry across San Jacinto River on the old Tuscacita Trail. Now those of you who know where I live, I attempted to build my home on the exact spot where Uncle Pleas' log cabin was. Now Pappy told me, now I came along too late to know uh, Uncle Pleas personally, because in his later years he had cataracts on his eyes and he had to spend the last two years of his life in Silsby with his only son who was a sawmill worker for the Carver Lumber Company and he went down there and spent the last two years passed away and is today buried in Silsby, Texas. It might be of interest to you to know that the Humble Chamber of Commerce had tried for many years to get the Silsby Chamber of Commerce to permit us to exhume Uncle Pleas and bring him back home. But no dice. Jack Fields led the, the, the charge for years until we found out that uh, we, it couldn't be done. So rest in peace. Uncle Pleas is buried today in Silsby. He was the third man to come into this area, and I have just told you where he lived. If you went down Old River Road, or you may know it as North Houston Avenue, if you went down it to where it just would just run off into the river, you're still on the old Tusca Cedar Trail, right there's where I live. And that's where he built his log cabin. Now we're going to roll three. And I want to tell you that in 1836, When he told these people about it, look how slow things moved. Transportation and communication were so slow at that time. It took the next group 12 years to make the move from Liberty to this area. As he got here in 1848 with Uncle Pleas right on his heels. Pappy settled right now. If you go... <coughs> Old River Road or North Houston Avenue, and when you get to the bypass, there'll be a stoplight. Right on your left is a little tune-up place there. This tune-up place was in our front yard. There's where I was raised, right there on that spot. Our lot was in the back with our barn, right where Kenny's Restaurant used to be, where the new Humble Station is now. They, they, they built their station right in the middle of our hen house. <laughs> on down the road, you'll find a little paint company over on the right-hand side. That was our sweet potato patch. I grew up there. I, 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 I never did like farming very much. Of course, I liked, I liked the oil fields a whole lot less, but I never did like farming very much. And I tried to find an easier way to make a living, and the only way I knew to do that was to after five years in the oil fields, to go back to school, and I did. And I went to San Marcos, and I got a degree, and out of, this, out of college, right into World War II, and out of World War II, into Humble, Texas, for a teaching job. That was 1945, during the Christmas holidays. There were a total enrollment in Humble Independent School District, a total enrollment, elementary, Grammar school, we didn't know what no middle school was then. <laughs> Elementary school, grammar school, and high school, 156 in high school. Eight teachers, superintendent and principal, both of them taught classes. There was 526 total enrollment. Oh, we come a long way. We come a long way. <laughs> then along came in 1878, we got the 18th. President Ulysses S. Grant, we got a railroad. A narrow grade railroad was built from Houston to Shepherd. And this narrow gauge railroad from Houston to Shepherd served this area for many years. And finally, of course, the H E and W T took it over and 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 the new railroad system that we know of today from here to Lufkin H E and W T was built. Then, in 1880, when we had the 19th president, we're going to have our town officially named.
it was officially named. Now, just before this town's naming, a man was elected to the Justice of the Peace here in this area. His name was Uncle Pledge. He was the only businessman in this area. He operated a ferry across the river. He would haul you and your family and your ducks and your geese and your jinnies and your goats and anything else, your wife and kids and so on. Ten cents, total fee. It was one of those old ferries that you pull across by a rope. It was simply a floating barge. So we come to the 22nd president. In 1886 is the year, and finally, finally, we get a school. Anybody here happen to know where that school was built? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to let you chew on it just for 10 seconds. Where was the first school? If you really would take just a minute and dig a little bit, I actually think some of you could come up with the answer. But I'm going to tell you. The first school was built to be used as a school and a church. Now, what does that tell you? What usually was behind church houses in 1886 besides a little bitty house with a moon or a star on the front door? What was behind churches? Cemeteries. Where is the old humble cemetery? And that's where the school and church was built. On old Isaac's Road, fronting on what you know today as South Houston Avenue, on old Isaac's Road, they built a little one-room school. And they appointed Booge as a committee of one to go to Houston and find somebody to teach that one-room schoolhouse, and he did. A red-headed, freckle-faced lady. <laughs> Her name was Rose Hamlin. She got here, the school was three months, and she had a total of one round dozen youngs. Twelve was the total enrollment. School lasted for the three months term. The town was officially named. Now, in 1890, we see officially named. By that, by the vote of the people in this area, and there were by now, there were some two dozen families. The Lees, the Lees, very prominent people. The Lambricks, Nick Lambrick in 1904 was a Justice of the Peace and County Commissioner here. Now, of course, back in those days, it was draw water from a well. He started our little water system. In 1905, the tank fell on him. Of course, the tank was just as high, that high as the roof here. It served a few families in Humble. And they dug him out, none the worse for wear. There's one of those old uh, uh, Cypress tanks with bales around it. And they started all over again. That, that was Nick, and then of course his son was Alfred. And the, and the Lambrick that you know today who built old Lambrick Town, his name is Alfred also. Reminds me of another little story. When I was in the school business, my kids was always trying to figure out how old I was. You know, I can't understand why kids won't know how old their teacher is. Invariably, they will dig at it. They'll pry at it and so on. And they got smart. They wouldn't come right out and say, Coach, how old are you? No, they would say something like, Coach, when was that well drilled down, down on, uh, on Moonshine Hill Road? An old river road, and I'll say that well was drilled in, in uh, 1912. That well is only 1,800 feet deep. They'd say, uh, Coach, how old was you when that well was drilled? <laughs> <laughs> that went on. That went on. It went on. One day I got tired of it, and I walked in the classroom, and I said, Okay, you guys. If the United States is bordered on the north by Canada, and on the south by Mexico, and on the east by the Atlantic Ocean, on the west by the Pacific Ocean, how old am I? Alan Lee, sitting on the front row, raised his hand. I said, okay, Alan, how old am I? He said, Coach, you are 44. I said, well, Alan, that's right. How'd you know that? He said, I got an uncle that's half nuts, and he's 22. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
rolling right along. <laughs> Ulysses says, Grant, he's done been here and gone, and his train's done blowed its last whistle. We got us a church, a school, and the town name, and now we're going to see a family of people come in here from Leggett. Their names were Bender. They made a couple of year stops over here at spring. They brought with them four boys and a girl. The youngest of the boys was named Charles, a very energetic, enterprising fellow. He had an imagination that spanned from here plumb to Conroe. Did you know you can go down to the you, you can go down to Humble Savings and Loan and walk across the street to where the Deerbrook Mall has been built? And you can step on that dirt right there, and did you know that you could walk to Conroe without stepping off of Bender property? Did you know that when you cross the San Jacinto River from Highway 59, that you could walk through them woods to Spring, Texas, and never step off of Bender property? He had vision. And just before the turn of the century, a man who had owned the sawmill named Carter sold it to Millage and Calhoun. And Millage and Calhoun sold it to uh, Tom Shelton. And Tom Shelton didn't make a go of that sawmill either. They called them Peckerwood sawmills in those days because a Peckerwood could cut more trees down than those sawmills could. <laughs> so Charles Bender came in here, took over this sawmill, and by the turn of the century, by as soon as the clock went around, he had things buzzing. And the whistle of the dickies and the whine of the of the, saw, the saws turning were the sounds and activities that you could see and hear in this area. Charles Bender, he really made a go of it. It was a sad day in Humboldt in 1929 when Charles Bender closed down his sawmill. But something else had happened along the way. A fellow by the name of Slaughter was rafting logs down the river because the river was the highway that the sawmill used and he was rafting logs down the down the the, the river. I promise you, Alan, that I'm not gonna go too much longer. Uh, I'm gonna come to an end pretty quick. Me and Elsie has got something to do when this shindig is over. So we're not going to keep you too long. He wrapped and logged down the San Jacinto River when dinner time come. He got out his little sack lunch, sat down there on the bank, and he noticed at the edge of the water, from the edge of the water, there comes a bubble. Bubble, 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 bubble. Then he took out his blowing horn, put his thumb over the blowing the small part of the horn, inverted it over this bubble, 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 struck that match. Eureka! It had been discovered. Gas. Now, he tried unsuccessfully to get other people to become involved and in, in, to invest in, 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 in a, the actual drilling of an oil well. But, it wasn't to be until after Spindletop happened. You see, there had only been one successful oil well drilled in the whole of the United States. That was in Titusville, Pennsylvania. There was no need for it. They finally figured out that they could get kerosene for the lamps, and there became a need front for it. And at that time, a little later on, a fellow by the name of Selden, Duryea, Harrison, and a fellow by the name of Henry Ford was working on an engine that would operate by gas, gasoline. So there came to be a need, but you will note that it was, it was three years before he finally found his man, a watchmaker in Houston, Texas. I'm glad he found a watchmaker and he didn't find a car practice. You know, I took my good health over to a chiropractor here in Humble, Texas some years ago. He don't work on my back. He plays it like a piano. <laughs> when I go to my great reward, and if St. Peter comes to the door, and he says, Bevel, you've been a good boy. 
come on in. I'm going to say, St. Peter, have you got any skiers? Or have you got any dentists? Or have you got any car practice in there? Which I don't think he's going to have any of any of them. But he does. I'm going to say, St. Peter, time out. I want to think this situation over. I've had my problems with them fellas back down yonder. Anyway, after he gets through playing my back like a piano, if he ever does need an endorsement, I stand to tell you, when I leave there, I trot. Not because I'm well, I just want to get the hell out of there. <laughs> we will notice that it was four years before he finally found a jeweler named S.H. Hart. And they drilled an oil well. You got any idea where that oil well was drilled? I'm going to tell you where it was drilled. If you went out on Moonshine Hill Road, which incidentally was the first improved road in Harris County, it was the first concrete highway, a mile and a half of it from Mumble to Moonshine Hill, that road was built, was laid, the concrete was poured in 1911. So if anybody asks you, there's your answer, right there. S.H. Hart invested in this. They drilled a well that if you went out Moonshine Hill Road and just before you got to the Goss settlement, just before you got to Homer Goss's house, you pass over a little old bridge, that's Jordan Gully. Now if you stop on Jordan Gully and you look to Wildcat Stadium, you're going to look right through the first well. That was a pine sapling thicket out there then. After oil was discovered, we used to start at Old Lambrichville, and when you cross the road, you said King Sex, and we played chase from one Derrick floor to another, jumping from one to another. There was all over that country close enough that a ten-year-old boy could jump from one to the other. And 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 after years and years of spilling the residue of an oil field on the dirt. It takes a hundred years for dirt to recycle itself after that happens. That's the reason that's a prairie out there now. Anyway, there was a little community out there. Oh, there was uh, 50, 50 families built up around this, the heart of the oil field. It was called Brown Store. And incidentally, I just happened to be fortunate enough to know the whole clan of the Browns. They had one boy who was a real good athlete for the Elmer Wildcats. Okay, that's where the first well was drilled. It struck a gas pocket and blowed the pipe out of the hole and scattered it all up through them pine sap and thinking like spaghetti out through there. And it took them three years before they found equipment to come out of Oklahoma that had been in Titusville, Pennsylvania, to finally be big enough, strong enough, and enough know-how to drill a well that would produce a hundred thousand barrels a day through an open 10 inch pipe. And they re-drilled it and a fellow by the name of Higgins did it. Why Higgins? There's your answer. Why Granberry? He was right on his tail. Why Herman? He built one of the biggest roundhouses. I call them roundhouses for lack of a better name. It was the heart of activity of oil wells all around. Those that were plumbing, it was a great big, had a big wheel in it. This wheel would turn and make the pump pump up and down and so on. Herman Stati. Stati was an investor. He made his fortune right here in Humble. So did Mrs. Melly Asperson that built the Esperson with humble money. So did Jim Silver Dollar West, who made his money right here at Forest Cove, and just before you get to Kingwood. That's where the money came from. It came from humble, pronounced U-M-B-L-E, <laughs> humble tax. In 1931, in 1931, the scuttlebutt swept this community. I was sophomore in high school at the time. Now, prior to that time, Kern Tips called the football games every Saturday from the Southwest Conference. 
The Humble Oil and Refining Company. Humble Oil and Refining Company. Humble Oil and Refining Company. But in 1931, Kern Tip said, The Humble <laughs> Oil and Refining Company. And the scuttlebutt swept the town. That. Flair Zumble's only son was going to bring a suit against the Humble Oil and Refining Company for using their family name for personal gain. <laughs> so the smart lawyers from Philadelphia, rather than change all that advertising, change all that buildup that the Humble Oil and Refining Company had, had, had taken them years to do, they simply mispronounced the word. It all started right here. The Humble Oil and Refining Company was started by, by, by people, but the, the first meeting, now I wouldn't say that the, the, the company was organized here, but among the first meetings was right down, right across the street sideways from where the old Robin Chevrolet place of business was on Main Street, where the news messenger is now. Right across the street was the old Hale House, a two-story white house, stood there for years since the boom days. Well, R.C. Hale and a man by the name of Ross Sterling, among others, <coughs> met there. In fact, Yagi Hale told me about the meet. He even remembered what they had for supper that night. He told me we had the best supper I ever sat down to. <coughs> we had pork chops and scrambled eggs and sausage, and we had all kinds of jellies and jam because... The VIPs of the Humble area was to meet in our living room to discuss the formation of an oil company. They did, and it did happen later, and they called it the Humble... No, they called it the Sunshine Oil Company. They went into this area, bought leases, and they hit seven consecutive dry holes. And all of them almost went busted. Okay. They tried to sell their part of the stock, and Hale did, did find a buyer. He went into, he went into a, a uh, hardware store here in Humble. The hardware store was run by Mr. and Mrs. R.E. Smith. He said, Mr. Smith, would you like to buy some of my stock at so-and-so and so-and-so? And, so and, so? and Mr. Smith says, no, I ain't, I'm not going to put my money into none of that foolhardy stuff. No, I'll keep my money right here in dishpans and so and so and so hardware and so on. And Mrs. Mrs. Hale spoke up and says, I will buy some of your stock. She did. And if you've been around here very long, when Mrs. R.E. Smith passed away, the property was sold to the Benedinas and the heirs, a boy and a girl, split the estate, his, the boy, the boy that was left of Mrs. and Mr. R. E. Smith's grandson inherited something like forty million dollars. <laughs> that was just his cut. She bought the stock. Now, this company that drilled seven dry holes went to what was called in Goose Creek. Goose Creek, you know it is Baytown now. And they hit one right after another, one right after another. And they call them the humble people, the humble people. The humble people is really doing good. The humble people is really making it. The humble people, humble people. So they changed their name to the humble company. And there's how the story goes. When um, humble was at the height of its boom, how many people was in this town at that time? Have I got it on here? Yes, sir. There was 25,000. And they lived in, in shacks and in tar paper huts and in pasteboard boxes and any place they could get in out of the weather. They dumped the mail on Main Street. And you just simply walked down Main Street to the piles and rippled through. You see, Bender Sawmill took the... Took the took the post office into the sawmill, and the man who was in charge of the post office at that time was named Landweir. Anybody know any Landweirs around here? Well, there's some here. Their name's not Landweir because Mrs. 
Blair, mother of Ross Blair, his name was Landweir. Her father was the postmaster for the Bender Sawmill. And so I come to the end of the story. 25,000 people in three communities. The communities were Humble, Crosbyton. Yeah. Crosbyton started at the flowing water well and went down to, to the Ferris Class Company. Derrick's houses, all mangled saloons. I so very, very well remember my earliest childhood. It was a cigar store, a tobacco house. A little bitty old man, about this tall here, that operated a little tobacco house right there across the street sideways from the water well where the Texas Company service station. His name was Levy. And the reason why I knew him is because he would buy aluminum. Don't nobody throw out no pot and pan, pots and pan, aluminum pots and pan. Now, aluminum was pretty scarce in old days. You didn't find too much of it. But anyway, if I could find some aluminum, I might could get enough of it together to go down there to get me some, some picture show fare for next Saturday, which cost a dime. I got another extra nickel, I could buy a package of popcorn. When in that old picture show, the first three rows of seats was benches with backs on them. And that's where the kids all sat. And there was an old gentleman here in Humble who would come and come into the show on a Saturday matinee, and he would stand up in front of all these kids, and he would read all the captions. Because kids couldn't read, they hadn't they had started school yet. So he read all the captions. Now, folks, I'm going to have just a couple of minutes, I promise you. No more than three. What's your question? Anything on your mind? Something I might have overlooked. You got a question? Okay. You got, haven't got any question. I'm going to say at this time, please, all lines, all linuses, all visitors, invited and otherwise, and his honor the tail twister, will you please all rise. Now before I show you this next card, I want to tell you how grateful I am. I hope you'll invite me back another day. I'm glad to be part of this. I'm fixing to show you the final card right now. You're all stood up. <laughs> That's what you call a standing ovation. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We sure appreciate you. Don't, don't go away now. Don't go away. And we, we want to show you our appreciation for your talk here tonight. And as a token of our appreciation, this is a 150th anniversary Texas Sesame Centennial belt buckle. I'm out of breath from saying all that. We'd like to present this to you and uh, say thanks for this fine talk. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. All, all right. Beautiful. All right.